down, friend. <laughs> yeah. Buddy, you learned all that from Texas, huh? <laughs> Go ahead. Everybody, welcome to Around the Rim. And I, I hesitate to say Around the Rim because we tossed around so many different names for this show today, but I am so excited to be bringing to you Around the Rim with my broadcast partner, Nell Fortner. And we're going to talk in a second to a distinguished group of panelists who have been around the world and back in the world of playing basketball, coaching basketball at every single level. We've got a great show in store for you. You are in the right place if you are ready for Around the Rim. Let me introduce to you my esteemed broadcast partner, Nell Fortner. Have a few words, please, darling. Hey, how's it going, everybody? <laughs> Thanks for um, everybody joining us today. This should be a lot of fun. I think it's going to be a little insightful with some basketball news and viewers and all that kind of fun stuff. So uh, let's have a good time. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Ladies, we're going to go ahead and get the show started and talk a little bit about why we wanted to do this show. We talked. I talked to Nell a few days ago, literally, and said, hey, let's do a, a pre-selection show, show where we talk to a, a group of folks who have – very strong opinions about where people should go. They've coached the game, they've played the game, they've sat out from the game, came back from the game, retired from the game. Just whole different conversation about what we're going to see potentially at the six o'clock uh, on the seven o'clock show on ESPN. So we tossed around some ideas for what we wanted this show to be about, and we really did want to bring together a unique group of folks who could have a diverse opinion on all different kinds of things. We've got Cynthia Cooper. Go ahead and wave to the crowd, Cynthia Cooper, who, as you guys know, played her basketball at the University of Southern California and is now the coach at USC as well. We've got co-panelist Carolyn Peck, who won a national championship at Purdue. Also, while I was playing in the WNBA, was a coach at um, the Orlando Magic. Wave, Carolyn Peck. We'll get to talk to her in a little bit. <laughs> Um, we also have Stephanie White. I hope Stephanie joined us. Stephanie played her ball at, at Purdue. Didn't you play for, for Carolyn Peck, Stephanie White? Well, let me tell you, Fran, her Joe mic's Boy. not working on her uh, okay. computer. All right, well, Stephanie White won't get to say anything. We'll talk to Stephanie later. All right, we've got, we've got Sue Favor, who is a, a big women's basketball blogger. We will not see Sue. She is incognito today, but we will hear Sue. Sue, are you there? I am here. Outstanding. And then we also, in a few minutes, we'll have Coach Karen Aston, who's the coach at the University of Texas. So let's go around the horn real quick and just let everybody tell us a little bit about the, the atmosphere. Hey, Fran, I'm here. Oh, hey, Coach. Okay. <laughs> Good. Good. All right. Carolyn Peck, we will, we will start with you today, Carolyn Peck. Let's talk a little bit about what you anticipate from tonight's show in terms of where teams will go in the, in the tournament seating. I cannot wait, Fran, for this to start, and the biggest thing I'm most excited about is to see what the committee decides to do with not only who the number one seeds are, but where those number one seeds are going, because with the predetermined sites, not only for the regional, but for the sub-regional, where's everybody going to land? Yeah. All right. Nell Fortner, jump in there. Well, I think that's a great, I think that's a great question, but you know, really... We probably, in our minds, already know those number one seeds. I mean, and, and logistically, really, doesn't UConn have to go to Lincoln? I mean, really, they can't send them to Louisville and have have them play Louisville for the fourth time to get to a Final Four. I mean, I, I see them going to Lincoln for sure. I think the biggest, maybe the one I'm waiting on, is the number two seeds. Like, is West Virginia going to bump in there, you know, like bump Louisville out and move them down to a three? Um, I think those number two seeds might be the most intriguing right now. Okay, but and, now, now, I hate to interrupt you, but my question is, yeah. if you move Connecticut to Lincoln, why are you protecting Louisville to play on their home court to have to play, a number one seed have to play on a number two seed's home court? Why protect Connecticut? Well, I don't, it's, I'm not sure it's protecting. I think the bigger issue is, isn't there some rule somewhere in the bylaws that you can't play somebody four times to get to the final four? I mean, there's some kind of there's something like that, but I, I just can't see them putting UConn in Louisville's region. But, but a, couple, a couple of years ago, Baylor and Texas A&M had to, had to do that exact same thing. Sure did. So why is... Why is Connecticut and Louisville any different? And 
when you look at the Big 12 and their RPI, their strength of schedule compared to where Connecticut and Louisville are in the American Conference, there's no competition. Right. No, you're right on that one for sure. How many times was Texas A&M and Baylor playing? Was that three or four times? To it, get would to have, the final? it would have been. It was their it fourth was time. Five. Four. Okay. Gosh. Well, then I guess it can happen. Absolutely. All right, real quickly, guys, I want to jump in with uh, Coach Cynthia Cooper. Coop, uh, Coop and I played against one another in college. Uh, I won't bring up the fact that we beat you in the 86 championship game yeah, at all. Don't, do that. don't bring that up for the national yeah, championship per that year. Perfect season. Yeah, don't, don't do that. Yeah, that would just be, you know, un unnecessary. Unnecessary roughness. There it you is. Got, you guys know Cynthia Cooper. She's a basketball legend, played her ball for the women of Troy at USC, played on two national championship teams, played on four WNBA championship teams. I'm sorry, say now, that last part again. I didn't hear you. One, two, three, four WNBA yeah. oh, championship God. teams with God, the I love Comments. Every time I hear that. I uh, love MVP it. with the, I mean, I could literally go on MVP you do like with me? the WNBA okay. Houston uh, Comments. Cynthia Cooper is in her first season with USC. And Coop, first of all, we applaud you, first of Need all, for help? going there, making some noise at USC. <laughs> well, what is it like to be going to the tournament in your first season? You know, I, I am just overjoyed. I, I've got to give props to this this team, my staff. You know, we just fought hard all season long, and I mean, I am overjoyed. Just thrilled that all of the hard work that we we did in the preseason and the 5 a.m., 6 a.m. you know workouts and weights and training and conditioning, it all pays off in the end when you're able to put together four games in your conference tournament and beat ASU beat Stanford and then a very hot Oregon State team in the championship to come away with that to come away with the Pac twelve championship. So I mean I'm thrilled. I'm overjoyed. I couldn't have I couldn't have written this script any more perfect. Any questions for Coop? I got tons of questions for Coop. Anybody else want to throw in any questions for Cynthia? Yeah, Coop, I've got a question for you. Um how did Kanisha Horn um melt into your team this year? Does she match pretty good for you and give you those good minutes that you needed to, to compete in the Pac-12? Yeah, I thought, I thought Kanisha um, had a period, and I think she's just coming out of that period where she had to adjust to the Pac-12 officials, the Pac-12 style of play, um, because she's a very physical player coming from Alabama. Um, and so she had to adjust to that, but she has really meshed in perfectly. She adds a, a level of toughness to us and a no-nonsense attitude when she goes out there to play. Um, and I know when I put her in, she's kind of our enforcer. Uh, we've got to keep her out of foul trouble, but other than that, she's played perfectly for us. Hey, Fran, this is Carolyn. I got a question for Coach Cooper, and I know how competitive you are. I've watched you in the WNBA, and taking that competitive spirit and bringing back to USC – how did you convey that to your players in order to win the Pac-12 tournament championship? Yeah, you know, I can be a little overwhelming with my passion sometimes. Um, and so I had to really give it in doses. So from the beginning of the year, we started in small doses. And then as we began official practice, another shot of, of kind of what we're really here for. And I love basketball so much. I love this university and our, and our program so much. I really wanted to instill that passion, that drive, and that determination into this team. And I really thought that they got it in the Pac-12 tournament because I told them it won't be enough to play the same way with the same intensity that we played in during a regular conference season. You've, you've got to step it up. And so my word, my term was step it up. My terms were, it was like, look, we've got to get it going. It won't be enough. And so we started out against an a Arizona team that really had nothing to lose, and then we came in and played hard, and it was a close game, and we won it. And then an ASU team, which we had lost to, we had lost to ASU in overtime at ASU. Uh, we won that game by two points. And then here we go, Stanford, you know, the number four team in the nation at the time, and I mean, just really playing great basketball with Cheney Ogumake. I mean, my gosh, she's incredible. <laughs> so, you know, right now we've played two games in two days. And this is our third game. Stanford's our third game. So we're a little more mentally fatigued. But who couldn't get up for Stanford? So we get, we get there. We, we win that game. I think the, where my passion and my drive came in was really that fourth game because we were tired. We were mentally tired. We were f physically fatigued. And so it was really me pushing them. Let's go. Let's go. And then that second half, 
when I pulled out the press, they all looked at me like I was crazy. Wait, <laughs> this is our fourth game in, our four, in four days, and, and you want us to press? I'm like, heck yeah. This is the last 20. We're going for this. Let you didn't go. say heck yeah. You did not say heck yeah. Uh, hey, we're on the air, right? <laughs> I said heck yeah. <laughs> One more question, I know, because your SID told me that you couldn't be here for very long, but if you'll remember a couple of days before you were hired, a couple of weeks before you were hired at Southern California, I was saying, how cool would it be for you, you played your ball at USC to get that job, and your response to me was, you didn't think that you were going to get that job. What's it feel like? What does it feel like for that actually to have come true for you? I mean, this has always, USC has always been my dream job. I think everybody in the country has always known that I wanted to come back to my alma mater. I wanted to lead the women of Troy. I wanted to put my stamp and my passion on this program. But more than anything, I wanted to give USC back what they gave me as a student athlete. And that's what I, that was my dream. And so, no, I didn't think it was going to happen. I didn't know that I would have the opportunity. But I will tell you, once I was given the opportunity, hard work, I just went right into automatic and just the hard work and the passion and really getting these kids un to understand there's a level of accountability that you have to have. There's a culture of winning. There is a mentality. There's an attitude that you practice with. There's an attitude that you play with. And that's what I really tried to instill into this program and infuse into this program right from the beginning. So I'm thrilled to be here. I'm thrilled to be home. I mean, fight on. Go Trojans. That's what I'm talking about, baby. <laughs> All right. Thank wow. you very much, Cynthia. Good luck in hey, the tournament. You guys, this the fantastic show. Good job, friend. Way Thank to you, go, Mama. Coach Fortner. I'm I sorry, I can't call you now. <laughs> <laughs> take care, you guys. All right, take care. Thanks for being on. My hey, pleasure. Let me ask um, Sue. Hey, Sue, you're still there, right? Yes, ma'am. Let's talk about um, the Pac-12 for just a minute. And had USC not won the Pac-12 tournament, would they have received a bid? And do you think the Pac-12 is going to get five teams in? Boy, that's an excellent question. Um, you know, to be, I, it's hard for me to gauge the selection committee. I think USC probably would have had a great chance of still getting a bid. I honestly don't see the Pac-12 getting five bids in, though. Some people do. I, I, I think probably the next one after uh, USC, Cal, and Stanford will be Arizona State. But as far as getting that fifth one in, I really am not too sure about that now. So you, you think Oregon State will be left out? Oh, excuse me. You know, actually, you know, that's a good point. Oregon State really, really, you know what? You might be right. Oregon State might be the one because Ruwek really has him, really has him going right now. Um, he's exceeded all expectations. Right, exactly. So we're looking at Cal, you know, USC because they won, Stanford, Cal, Oregon State, and Arizona State, right? Yeah, and maybe this is a good question for the panel. I clearly see the Pac-12 coming up. Uh, in the in the in this you know respect and all that kind of stuff. How do you see it out there not being on the West Coast? Because I don't want to be accused of West Coast bias, but I see the conference getting getting very strong. What do you guys? How do you guys feel? Carolyn, what do you think? I, I think it has. Uh, I think with the coaching changes that have happened, and you talk about Oregon State, they finished the season, and one of the big uh, components of the selection for the committee is how you finish. And they finished nine and one. They have an RPI of 35. I think the Pac-12 made a concerted effort of beefing up their out-of-conference schedule. I also the co think the coaches within the Pac-12 has done a terrific job of bringing talent into the pick to the Pac-12 that makes them competitive and not noteworthy around the country. Yeah. Hey, Nell Fortner. Yes. I'm going to swing over to the East Coast because I think I just saw Dawn Staley pop her head in, and I know she's on a time frame, and then i got to get Karen Aston on as well. So let's go to the East Coast. Dawn Staley in the house, everybody. Give it up for Dawn Staley, hey, the Dawn. coach of South Carolina. Dawn Staley. <laughs> Technology. <laughs> <laughs> we are so techno. We're, we're just a bunch of techno nerds, Dawn. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Listen, Don, this is Fran Harris. How are you doing? I was talking to Nell and Carolyn earlier about the coaches that we have on the show today. We have Karen Aston at Texas. We've got Cynthia Cooper at USC. We've got you, and all three of you happen to be coaches who've gone into situations and realized that you that – the clock was running, and so you've done your work very quickly in your programs to turn those programs around. How were you able to do that at South Carolina? 
Well, I mean, I think it just takes a, it takes some patience. Um, it also, you know, takes, you know, being able to uh, get support from your administrators, support from, you know, everybody at this university. But also, you got to get the players that believe um, in your vision. And once they start believing in your vision, they see uh, it produces wins, and then wins um, produce uh, ch championships. And we were able to be a part of. Um, a special championship, you know, right here on our home court, and it's been pretty special. Hey, Dawn, um, great job on winning the SEC, because that's not an easy task, but let me ask you this. I, I know that you went to the SEC tournament, egg, took an exit a little quicker than you wanted to, I'm sure, but what lessons can your team learn from at least going into that tournament, even though you didn't win as many games as you wanted, what lessons did you learn that's going to carry over for y'all, your young team, into the NCAA tournament? Well, you know, I thought in, in the SEC tournament, I thought we, we got, you know, a little bit away from what got us there, which is we like to pound the ball inside and play inside out. Um, I didn't think we particularly rebounded the ball, you know, as well as we rebounded the ball all season long. And part of that is um, our, our shot selection. we got to get a little bit better with taking better shots um, so we can rebound the basketball. Um, and I thought some of our shots led to some easy basket by, you know, Kentucky especially. Um, but we just have to get back. I think we've, we've had some tremendous time off. We also have been back into the gym working on the little things that, you know, can separate us from um, going home early to, you know, extending it you know, further in the tournament. Hey, Don, this is Carolyn. Um, you've yeah. had a tremendous year all year long. Uh, some say yeah. divert, you're deserving of a number one seed versus a number two seed. Um, how do you see what difference would that make as you play on in the tournament? Well, you know, I think a number one seed puts a tremendous amount of pressure you know, on us to continue to perform, and I don't know what that would do uh, for our young team. Mm -hmm. yeah, the number two seed is right is right there um, as well. But I think, you know, I think this team has done some tremendous things all season long. Whether we're a one, whether we're a two, you know, everybody's got to everybody's got to lace them up and play. You know, it is win or go home, and so everybody's going to be forced to play under those uh, strains of uh, playing well um, every night that we step on the floor. Don, this is Sue Favor. This was kind of a breakout year for you uh, in the Gamecocks. What do you think got you uh, to that point this season? You know, well, I think this team is, has some great team chemistry. You know, they committed to staying uh, to both summer sessions last year. And when your team makes that kind of commitment, uh, you, you have something that coaches really try to force, which is for them to spend a lot of time together, force them to like one another. Uh, but I think with this team, it came natural because they spent so much time with each other um, during the summers that, you know, once the fall got here and we got a chance to, you know, roll the ball out, you know, we, we were ahead of the, ahead of the you know, ahead of the game when it came to that. Anybody? I'm going to ask another question. Anybody final else want to question? Ask? Final question, Nell Fordner, before we go to Karen Aston. Well, Don, you've done some some great things at South Carolina to get your fans in the stands. So that had to have been just phenomenal for you to walk out on that floor and see. I think what was your biggest crowd this year? Ten, twelve thousand? Um, about twelve and a half thousand was okay. our biggest. And that was our last game. They showed up to see us uh, win outright the SEC uh, regular season championship. And you know, we we by far, you know. Whether it's 12,000 or whether it's 5,000 or whether it was 1,500 six years ago, they are the best fans because they're loyal. They keep coming. They bring friends of friends. And then, you know, they have been extremely supportive. Win, lose, or draw, uh, they have been there. But I think our marketing department has done a tremendous job, you know, at creating some catchy um, themes to get people in the stands. But ultimately, winning is going to get people in those seats. Yeah. Absolutely. You got to win. Don, thanks so much for being with us today. Don, Appreciate thank it. You. Thank you guys thank for having good this good tournament. Good luck in the tournament. Thank you. All right, let's move on back toward the center of uh, the universe to my hometown, Austin, Texas, where we have the head coach of the University of Texas Longhorns, Karen Aston. Karen Aston in the house. Karen, what's happening today in Austin? Not a whole lot. You tell me. I like those long horns behind your head. <laughs> Gee, I wonder where Fran is right now. I know. I wonder too. 
I think I saw her roaming around in practice. <laughs> Gosh. Hey, hey Coach. Hey, everyone. I, I hey. wish Dawn and, and Cynthia were still on here. First of all, I, I, I know Dawn's not on here, but I spent some time in Charlotte around Dawn's program, and, and what she has done has been a testament to me of patience, diligence, and a lot of hard work, uh, you know, because I think she had to go through some times where the program took some steps forward and then all of a sudden it took a step back and I, I have so much appreciation now that I'm at Texas and I understand how difficult this is I have a lot of appreciation for what Donna's done well, and I don't want to play Cynthia I will tell you I don't <laughs> want to play I've watched that team play well it's been yeah it's been fun for me just being here in SEC country to watch what Dawn's done and to watch her really grow as a coach because she has really her style has changed a little bit somewhat and and we talked about this me and her did earlier in the year and it's been fun watching her make some adjustments to coaching the young kids of today and um, it's really paid off for her this year but Karen let me ask you getting started first of all congratulations on the NCAA tournament and I know that was y'all's probably primary goal this it year it really to, was it yeah, really was get back there so you've done that now it's on to whatever your next goal is that you've made with your team so, but in saying that, I, and I've said this all year long in watching y'all, nobody wants to play y'all. <laughs> On a good day, y'all can be absolutely outstanding. You've got size, you've got quickness, you've got bench depth. So you're a pretty dangerous team right now and, and for an NCAA tournament run. So right now, how are you feeling about your team and their level of excitement going into the tournament? I feel really good about them. I didn't quite know how. We took a few days off after the loss to West Virginia in the tournament. Didn't know really how they would come back. And, and honestly, I just told them just a few minutes ago, I met with them after practice and told them that I thought Saturday's practice, I gave them Sunday off, but Saturday's practice was actually one of our best of the entire year. I, I thought they had a lot of enthusiasm, uh, a lot of intensity. They were having to go against each other, which I know you and I have talked about that now, but it was interesting to watch them because we were on spring break and we didn't have the practice guys. So it was really quite interesting to see them go against each other and, and enjoy the level of competition that we've gotten to, which is, it's a testament to where our program really was a, a year or so ago and where we are now is that we can actually go against each other and it is quite competitive. And Karen, this is Carolyn, and one of the things I noticed to your team, I don't know if you 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 hung like raw red meat around the rim, but now <laughs> she referenced the the inside game and how tough they are. How did you toughen them up inside? Well, I think first of all, I would I would echo a little bit of what Dawn and Cynthia both have talked about, which is that we have a team that that really made a commitment they made a commitment last summer uh, you know we didn't go to the NCAA tournament I, I don't even know that they knew why they didn't go I don't even know that they knew why they weren't being successful so we sort of just reset and said okay these are the things that you have to do and that we all know you have to do to be successful and one of those was training in the summer and being very serious about the training so it started there and I mean, I have a I have a passion for post play. Uh, I, I don't know. You wouldn't think I would because I'm a little <laughs> mite, but but I, I love post players. I love coaching post players. I, I that's what I coached when I was here with Coach Conrad. So it, I just developed an enormous passion for post play, and I think we have some players that have a lot of potential at that position. But I like rebounding, uh, you know. So we really get after it in practice with that. I think from you know, from what Nell talked about, our potential is unlimited. I don't even think these players know how good they can be because there was a, there was a level of, of a lack of confidence with these players when we inherited them. So I think we're just learning that we can actually be a really good team. Karen, how difficult is it to play in the Big 12 and, and have to face the teams that you face once, let alone having to see those, those teams twice and then again potentially a third time in the conference? What was that like and what was the wear on your team all season? Well, luckily we had some depth that Nell was speaking of and I, I, it really helped us uh, down the stretch in some games. But, I mean, I think it's the best, best league in the country. I, I think it is the most from top to bottom. The, most, the highest level of competition from top to bottom. I think the other piece that makes it so difficult is I think the coaches are phenomenal. And every game you know that you, you can't rest for a second. You know that every possession counts. You know they're going to have something up their sleeve. 
So it's a constant grind on you, not only physically but mentally. And I think that there were times that I could tell that some of the players really had never experienced that mental fatigue before. But I thought we really got our, our batteries re-energized really before the tournament. I, I thought it took a load off of our players to finally know that they had made the NCAA. I think they knew they had it locked up after the TCU win. And it they sort of took a deep breath, and I know that they realized they had accomplished some goals that we had set forth. And I know they're not the goals that Texas should have. We should have the ultimate every single year, and we do. But we had to take some steps with this program, and I thought we took some significant ones this year. One quick follow-up for you, Karen, is you've got, you mentioned your depth on, on your team. That's depth in terms of games. You don't have a whole lot of players, though, who have been tested in the postseason. What do you anticipate from this young team heading into NCAA play? Well, Fran, you've watched us play a lot, so really, who knows? <laughs> we make a joke about it all the time because I love transition, and, and Lowell from the Longhorn Network makes a joke that we talk about. I talk about how I want to be an up-and-down team, and so every time before we did our show, he joked about the fact that we really are up and down a little bit, and, and it comes from the youth. I mean, seriously, you don't. I don't know how they'll react to this. I know how they're practicing, and I think any coach, and you all have all been coaches, any coach would tell you that you think your team will perform. It's a reflection of how they're, they're practicing. Mm -hmm. I think that's what most coaches feel. So I feel like we're going to go into the tournament ready to play because they, they, they're they wanting to be coached right now. You know, some teams, they're through, they're tired. Uh, they really don't want to hear any more from you, but we're trying to get better, and I'm really pleased with where our team is. Hey, so, let, me ask, let me ask Sue a question real quick. Sue, you still there? Yes, I am. You know, she Karen has Imani staff, Imani McGee Stafford, um, six seven post player, phenomenal player. Did you watch her play in high school? And if so, or or have you seen her play and progress to to her through her sophomore year? Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that. Now I was sitting here uh, trying to uh, wanted to jump in on that. I did watch Imani play in in uh, high school, and at that point, she just was a really raw talent. But you know, you could see that she. She could really benefit from some player development, and I noticed she is your um, second leading scorer on the team, Coach Aston. Um, and then you just mentioned that you were you were really big on post play. Maybe you could talk a little bit about how, her development, and also what you think is uh, it takes to develop a team to get ready for the NCAA tournament. Um, as we've seen, it does take time, and it doesn't happen overnight. I'm thinking about you know Oregon State, Cal State Northridge, Don Staley's work at South Carolina. Maybe you could speak a little bit to that too. Oh, absolutely. I, it, it is a process, and that is the thing that we have preached to our players. When, Because last year I thought we went through some moments when we were pretty good, but every time something would go wrong, they would just crater. And it was just like it was the end of the world when something went wrong. So what we have preached all year long really is about the process. You, know, you set some, some minor goals, then you set some larger goals, and every time we achieved one, we would check it off and we would celebrate it. If it was with beet juice, we were still celebrating, <laughs> celebrating because literally this team needed to understand the process, which again started in the fall, I mean started back in the summer. And every time we would get to a certain point where I thought they were sort of maybe backsliding a little bit, which is what I think programs do when they really don't know how to get there. Uh, we would just talk about it. We would get in a room. We would discuss it. I mean, we've done some team building. We've done a lot of work with these players to get them to understand that there are going to be failures because that was the biggest problem with them. It took me a long time to figure out last year with that team that it was really a confidence factor, and it wasn't that they didn't want to be good and they didn't want to be coached. They really had a lack of confidence. So, so it's just as much mental almost as physical sometimes, no isn't it? No question. I, I really feel like even the West Virginia game, I think have, they were in the semis of, of the conference tournament. They were really, really excited about winning the quarterfinal game because really, honestly, we, hadn't won a, we, have, we had not won a postseason tournament game in quite some time. So this team has to learn how to get not quite so high and not quite so low and learn how to really level off and get very businesslike about what we're doing. All right, Coach Aston. I know you got to go right. get ready for your post Welcome, for your show. Thanks, Thank Karen. you so much for hanging in there with us, Karen, um, and everybody. We've had some great coaches on here. Sue, you're still there. I have you unmuted. Um, let's talk for a minute about what we've heard from Cynthia Cooper, what we've heard from Don Staley, and what we've heard from Karen Aston. Carolyn. Well, I, I think the biggest thing is we've got coaches in the game who get it. They understand about 
you know, developing players and people. And it's not a short term. All the coaches that we've had on, they're about developing programs, not just having a winning season. And that's something I'm really excited about and, can, and looking forward to continue to watch. Now, I, totally, I, do, I totally agree with that, Carolyn. I think you hit it right on the head. Um, they understand how to build programs and, and, and then you, you bring those kids uh, along also, but it's a process. And today's kid is different than 10 to 15 years ago. So there's another kind of an adjustment period for coaches at this point. It's like I was talking to Dawn earlier this year. She really has adjusted her coaching style, and it has paid dividends for her with this young team that she has. And it's been fun watching her coach on the sidelines to watch her be patient because Dawn hasn't always been <laughs> the most patient you know, of coaches, but yet she is now. And we were, I've, I've been fortunate to watch Karen coach a lot this year, and she's, she does a great job managing her players. And I think a lot of it is that, managing your players um, and, and building that confidence. You know, she, she kept saying the word confidence, that they lacked confidence. And, and you'll hear coaches say, that the number one thing a player needs when they get on the floor, forget the skills, forget everything. They've got to have confidence. And that's, hey guys, um, yeah, let's talk a little bit about the players today, what it means to coach in today's environment. Because I think all of us will agree that it's a different environment than when we played. It's a different environment when, than when the two of you maybe coached in, in college. I coach club teams in the summer, and i got to tell you, it is more than a notion to get these kids to try to get better and get to the next level. What have you guys seen out there in terms of this generation of players? Well, I can say um, as somebody who's dealt with the high school level that, um, yeah, you can't take anything for granted uh, these days, ladies. You have to sometimes just motivate them. Um, we, we've had, you know, oh, I'm not even going to come to practice, that type of stuff. So <laughs> coaches have to just motivate from the ground up. And um, I remember reading a few years ago before Coach Summit retired that um, even Coach Summit was having trouble understanding that, and Coach Summit was always real um, quick to change with the game, but even she was having trouble wrapping her head around that because that just wasn't something that you needed to do. And so you really kind of have to never take anything for granted with the young people today. They have a whole lot more distractions than we did. Um, they have a lot more things, you know, going on in that respect. So you really have to kind of keep an eye on them in all ways, all spheres. By last count, there are at least 10 Division One jobs open Carolyn Peck, Nell Fortner, are you jumping at one of those jobs? <laughs> I'm up a talk show. I've got a job. <laughs> I'm with you, Nell, on that one. I agree. <laughs> you know, but to to go off of what Sue said, um, I think that sometimes we're so quick to blame the kids, but I think especially the coaches that we had on. Um, and Dale talked about the patience of Don Staley. You know, kids come into this world as a blank slate, and they really become a product of what they learn. And when they have a coach that will take the time and the patience to teach them the right ways to go about things, they will catch on. And, you know, I, at, I was at the SEC tournament with Don Staley, and I tell you, after spending 15 minutes with her before a game, I felt like, man, I'm not doing anything in this world because this year's whole slogan for the Gamecocks was be the change. And she wasn't talking about changing just about winning basketball, but changing the world. And she was talking about changing them one person at a time and relating that to her experience in Africa. I mean, wow. those, kind of, those kind of people who are right now reaching out to kids, not trying to win ball games to get those five hundred, six hundred, seven hundred thousand dollar contracts but really are invested in, I mean, look, let's just be real. I'm just going to talk real. Dawn Staley is a black female that coaches in Columbia, South Carolina, that still waves the Confederate flag. Well, she's had well, well, well. <laughs> right, but let me tell you, she's had the opportunity to take a bigger contract, wow. uh, to go to a bigger job, but she said, you know what, I'm changing. And she didn't bring up the whole, you know, Confederate flag. I'm yeah. putting that point in there. But what I'm saying is this is a person who is invested in the children of South Carolina to make a difference and be role models to not just change the program, but change the state, the city 
of Columbia, South Carolina, the state of South Carolina, and our country, and then the world. Hey, to me, hands, hands down, those kind of people, that's what you invest in. Yeah. And if I, can throw in, if I can throw in something, too, another coach I'll put in that category is um, Cal coach Lindsay Gottlieb. She, she cares for the kids. Um, they know it. She teaches good basketball. She is like you all have said. She gets it. You know, she runs a complete and total program, and that response was, ex was extremely evident last year when they went to the Final Four. Um, she's a coach on all levels, and so I, I thoroughly agree with Carolyn about you got to teach to the whole young person these days. Yeah, that's a great point. And Sue, how old is um, Lindsay Gottlieb? I think she's like 36, 37, somewhere in there. So she's fairly young on the on the on the coaching yeah. scale. That's really young, and, and for, to be that young and to really get it and understand what you need to do for your young people, that's really impressive. Yeah, and her players, just they just they just think the world of her. They'll do anything for her, and uh, they, they play hard. They're just such a fun team to watch. When they come here, I just can't wait to when they come to L.A. just to sit near the bench and just watch all their, you know, them and their energy with each other, and it all comes from the top. So, I mean, you know, Lindsay and, and Dawn and um, – yeah, just coaches like that, young, energetic coaches that really can coach fully up and down. Those are the most fun co coaches and teams to watch. Yeah, and let me interject this about coaches who really you can tell care about their players. I'm going to throw Stephanie Gately's name in there from Fordham. Watching her, she won the A-10 tournament. Watching her interact with her players, talk about her players the day before the game in interviews, I'm telling you, she she gets it too. And and Stephanie is a lifer mid-major coach. And um, she has touched a lot of young women's lives in a very positive way. And it was really fun watching her win that tournament and get that team, that Fordham team, who really has lived in obscurity in Division One women's basketball for like 30 years, you know. So they to get to the NCAA tournament and and to watch her players absorb her in the celebration was really was really fun. You know they really care about their coach. That's a great analogy, you know. Yeah. Where did Fran go? Fran. She's taking a break. Hey, Carolyn, did yeah. you know this about Dawn when Ohio State was trying to get her interested in their job last year? The governor of South Carolina hey, called her. Hello. Here we go. Hey, here we go. We're going to do a quick T-shirt giveaway. If you want a Final Four T-shirt, you want the chance to win a Final Four T-shirt, you need to tweet right now. Tweet at Nell on Wheels and at Sports Talk Fran. The, folk, the four teams that you think are going to be the top seeds in the four regions in the women's tournament announced tonight. So we should only see four teams that you think are going to be the top seeds in those regionals. So you need to tweet at Nell on Wheels and at Sports Talk Fran, and the person who gets all four of those correctly will get a T-shirt. I'll bring you a T-shirt back from the Women's Final Four from Nashville. All right, so that's tweet at Nell on Wheels and tweet at Sports Talk Fran, the four top seeds for each region that will be announced on the show tonight. All right, so let's get back to the conversation. Let's talk about what we think. If we turn our attention to... What's going to happen tonight with the seedings, guys? What do we think is going to happen? Is it anybody? Is anybody thinking that Connecticut's not going to be the top seed? Oh, Connecticut is not the number one, number one seed. Okay. okay. The number <laughs> one. Okay. And 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 this is the reason being the number one, number one overall seed to me is Notre Dame. Okay. You know, with the wins that they've had to have and go undefeated. In the ACC, are you kidding me? Notre Dame is the number one, number one overall seed. I think okay. Connecticut is number two, but number one, and it is, I don't think, I had a conversation with a friend of mine today, I don't think that Muffet McGraw gets enough credit for what she did with that team in replacing what she let, lost. I agree. When you mm -hmm. lose yeah. Skylar Diggins and you lose... Mallory and you, I mean, with all that, and you were play, you have a freshman point guard in Lindsey Allen, and that team had, they went undefeated. I think that Notre Dame, you know, you beat Maryland, you beat Duke, you beat North Carolina. Notre Dame, to me, is the number one, number one overall seed. 
All right, so number one, Notre Dame. Number two, Connecticut. We can. That's kind of a given. Do you want to go with that? Who's Who's the next one? What's the next team? Um, I think that I think it's probably um, Stanford. Possibly. Really? Really? Yeah. Well. Oh no 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 no. What am I saying? I don't know. I don't, know. I don't let either. Me that, let me back that thing up. Back, back that it. thing up, Look, girl. Now break it. Yeah, you need to back it way up. <laughs> Let me back it up. Okay. Um, no, I think Tennessee. I think they're the third number one seed. And I think the reason why they've got a, a, their RPI, strength of schedule, all that, go, you know, notwithstanding, I think they're playing really good basketball right now. And I think that's very uh, – I'm not so sure exactly how important that is to the committee, but I'm just saying for me personally, I think that they are built to make a strong run in the tournament. I think they're playing their best basketball right now, and I, I think they're the number three, number one, if that makes sense. <laughs> All right, Sue, what do you think for the, the final number one? Put me on the spot. Um, <laughs> that That's a really good question. Um, I mean, I wouldn't – I don't know if I would put – I guess I'll start with who I wouldn't put. I don't know if I would put Baylor in there right now. Um, probably South Carolina. Interesting. Okay. All right, so we got Notre Dame, Connecticut, Tennessee, and South Carolina. I'm going to go Big 12 on you. I'm going to say West Virginia. West Virginia for the final top seed. And the number one. Yep, I am. Wow, okay. I am. Yeah. I like that team. I think they're solid. They're well coached. They just grind it out every single time. They beat Baylor twice, or, or was it three times this year? They beat Baylor twice this year. And they just have that, that it factor for me, that X factor. They go out there, nobody's worried about the names on the back of their jerseys. Okay, and Fran, they just they play really Baylor, hard. But they only beat Baylor once. They did? Yeah. I, did still them. I, I don't care. I don't care. <laughs> you know, people are just passionate. <laughs> I don't care. Hey, uh, hey, I'm not gonna, but, you know what? I'm going to keep them at number one. Hey, like Fran, them. this yeah. is the thing that I think – I don't think they're number one, but I think they're one of the most dangerous number yeah. twos. Yeah. Because I think Mike Carey is a fantastic coach, and I think that to have longevity in the tournament, you have to defend and you have to not be afraid of being physical. Yeah. And that's exactly what West Virginia does. Yeah, they're scary. They're okay, very I, scary. I have a question for everybody. Why didn't anybody pick Louisville? Because I don't think Louisville is one of the top four teams in the country. No, I don't either. I, I don't. I don't think they're one of the top four teams. Um, maybe the top eight, but not in the top four. And that's just through the eyeball test, really, yeah. just watching. Fair well, enough. And, and and I think with Louisville, and you know, the the most of the eyeballs are on Louisville when they play Connecticut, because you exactly. have to con be considered if you're number one team mm -hmm. on how you perform against Connecticut, and they throw the kitchen sink at Louisville and their discipline that Jeff Balls normally coaches with doesn't happen when they play Connecticut. So now how will they how will they compete against other teams until they possibly would meet a Connecticut? We're we're sure, we're right now not sure. Yeah. That's a good yeah. point. You know, um, Carolyn, I like let's go back and talk about your point of no Notre Dame being the number one C because I like your points that you made and, and I think what happens to us out in the um, out in the world here is we get kind of mesmerized by UConn's success over year in and year out, just all the time, and and how well they run their offense, and just how and the great players that he has, and we get kind of mesmerized by that, and we forget that there's anybody else out there that can rise to the level of UConn, and without a doubt, your points are very well taken. Notre Dame went undefeated, and they had to go through the ACC, who's going to have eight teams in the NCAA tournament. That is, that's pretty awesome for for, um, for Notre Dame. Well, and you look at they started the season out without Natalie Achanla. You know, right. she missed the first three or four games with a knee injury, and then they had Ariel Breaker and Marquisha Wright come in and fill in the post, and uh, Taya Reamer come in and fill in in the post, and again, they got a freshman point guard, right. and I think one of the most overshadowed players in the country last year was Michaela McBride. That girl can go, and she's got one of the most smoothest mid-range pull-up jump shots in the game. 
Yeah. It's beautiful. But the thing that I like most about Notre Dame is nobody's trying to be the show. Nobody's right. trying to be the star. They are the most efficient team to find the right players. You know, when they were talking about Florida with the men's bracket, and uh, Jimmy Dyke said, you know, they don't have any players that are really going to go to the, that are guaranteed to go to the pros. But they don't have any players that are worried about going to the pros. Well, yeah. Muffet McGraw at Notre Dame doesn't have any players that are worried about being All Americans. They got a whole team that is only concerned about winning a national championship. True team ball. Yeah. yeah. Guys, let's go dark horses. Let's go around the country. You can pick the conference that you want to pick, and let's go and talk about the teams that nobody's talking about that might slip off, slip, slip up on some folks and, uh, and get some wins out of the NCAA tournament that we may not be expecting. Nell, I'll start with you. Um, I'll, I'll put this dark horse out there, and, and I don't know really how dark they are because they're playing pretty good ball right now, and that's going to be Nebraska. Okay. Um, the other reason I say it, I think that, you know, as unfortunate as it is that there are home court advantages in the regional tournament, which they are going to do away with next year, but Nebraska at home in front of 16,000 people playing good basketball in a regional possibly semifinal and final, that's pretty tough. And um, I think that's um, – that's going to be something that's going to have to be overcome by whoever gets put in that region as the number one seed, and uh, that's a tough road to go through. Now, I would have to say that a dark horse is a team of youth, that if I were any other team that would possibly have to face this team, I'd be nervous because you wouldn't know what to expect, and that's North Carolina. They start yes. three freshman, yeah. a sophomore, and a junior. Yeah. And they can be on fight, on fire, orange, red hot. And they can hurt you because if they start hitting shots with Alicia Gray and Diamond to Shields doing what she does, and if Mavunga gets going inside, I, I've coached a team of youth that when they get in the NCAA tournament, they're so young and naive, they're not, afraid, they're not, they're not experienced enough to know what to be afraid or nervous about, and so they just go out and play all out. I think North Carolina is a team I would not want to see in my bracket. Yeah, if you could just play tough defense, though, really hard for about the first five or six minutes and not <laughs> let them get a shot, it might. It, that would probably do what you know, bode well for you because if Diamond DeShields comes down and hits her first three, it, it, it might be, yeah, it's going to be a tough game. a long night. That's Sue, right. Who do you think, Sue? Well, you know, um, I was going to say for Dark Horse, actually, I kind of agree with, with Carolyn about North Carolina, especially the Shields. Um, I'd also maybe put North Carolina State in there if uh, Gatling is, is back because uh, they, they've had a lot of energy this year. They've really responded to uh, their new coach, and um, they've done – they surpassed all expectations, including mine. I like, uh, I like Baylor. I say Baylor. It may sound very strange, but I say Baylor is a dark, a dark horse in this race. And it is only because, will we have three officials who will not be Odyssey Sims fans? Are there three officials in the world who are not Odyssey Sims fans and who will not stand around and just watch her <laughs> annihilate defenses, score 40 points, and give her every single call on the court? I mean, if we can find three officials who will just call the game the way the game should be called, then I think we'll see an interesting game with Baylor uh, in, involved in that. But I just, I love Odyssey Sims. She's one of the most competitive players out there. I think she literally, literally takes her team on her shoulders and just carries them to, to victory. But I think the challenge is figuring out what you throw at her defensively to slow her down. And I have not seen a team do an effective job at keeping Odyssey Sims from getting whatever she wants. Not this season, anyway. What's your favorite non-Texas team, Fran? What, what's that? What's your favorite non-Texas team, Fran? I'm just kidding. Uh, West Virginia, obviously. <laughs> West Virginia. <laughs> Remember? I've already talked about them. Okay. I love West Virginia. If I could get a second door, uh, dark horse, it would be West Virginia. Yeah, you can't hate on West Virginia. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard. Um, you hey. know, Od Odyssey Sims is definitely worth the price of a ticket. She's one of those offensive players that come along – Really rarely. We don't see that a lot. To be able to go out on any given night, on almost every night, score 40 points, yeah. it's pretty special. 
But it is going to be interesting. You, you bring up a great point on how the officials are going to officiate Baylor when it's crunch time. You know, it is serious crunch time. So last year we saw them let Brittany Griner pretty much get mauled. Will we see it, you know, will we see them let teams get a little more physical with Odyssey Sims in the play, you know, in the tournament? I got so, a question for you coaches. I got a question for you, Carolyn Peck and, and Nell Fortner, because we're going to stay with the Odyssey Sims and the Baylor thing. Kim Mulkey works the hell out of those officials, and y'all know it. <laughs> You know she starts from the tip. She works them up one sideline and works them down the other sideline. And she is calculating every single opportunity she gets. You know what? I'm going to plant this seed right here, and I'm going to plant that seed right there. And by the end of the game, they are dripping with sweat. They have been worked to death. How effective were you as coaches? And be honest, were you working the officials at Division One level when they were calling your games? Well, Carolyn, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to defer to Carolyn, okay? Well, you know, Fran and Nell, the first thing that my mom told me was wear your heels. Ah, there you go. Your height can be intimidating, but then mm -hmm. my mom also told me first to kill them with kindness. And so you would, you know, you would try to, to talk to them you know, person to person at first, but then when things still weren't getting changed, you know, the mercury did go up. But you have to, as a coach, I think that you have to manage it in a way that you cannot allow your frustrations that you have with the coach filter over to your players. And I think when it comes to Baylor, I think Tim, Kim does a good job of saying, let me handle the officials and you, you play the game. Mm -hmm. And that's what you have to do is you have to understand, you have to teach your players, look, I'm fighting for you, but I don't need you to get involved because you don't want the officials to start trying to pay, start paying attention yeah. more to the players. Let their focus be on you, but as players, they need to just keep their heads and do what it is they need to do. Yeah, I think you're, you're exactly right. I don't think I always did a great job of keeping my – Mercury down. Um, <laughs> <laughs> good way to put it. But, you know, hey, Nell, I got tossed out of a WNBA game, so my mercury measurement wasn't good either. I remember one time in a WNBA game, I walked straight out to the middle of the floor and said, Here I am. Would you talk to me? You know, you just got some hands. And he wouldn't talk to me, but he gave me a technical real fast. So, um, I think there's a real fine. You have to learn how far you can go with an official, and and how you can work that official. And um, I think that's just a learning curve for coaches um, year in and year out, as far as how much an official will take and and how to communicate with them. But I do agree with you. I think Kim Mulkey really does a masterful job of working the officials on the sideline throughout the entire game. Um, not every coach does that. Sometimes you see coaches who rarely talk to the officials, and um, and I'm not sure if that's a good or a bad thing, really, to tell you the truth. Maybe they listen to a coach more if they don't hear them the whole game yeah. long. You know? yeah. But um, it's always an interesting thing, and I think to, to see how the NCAA tournament will be officiated because these are the most important games. This is what everybody works for for, you know, 10 months of the year, 11 months, and now it's time to really um, see what you can accomplish, and the officials are a big part of that. And hey, now I, I think that, and Fran, one of the things to watch for in this tournament that I would watch when I was in the studio during the games, and we'd be watching games as they go on, is how coaches – manage the game as far as working the officials is one, but the other thing is timeouts and timings of timeouts and what they do out of those timeouts. And Kim Mulkey is one of the best. Yeah. Interesting. That's a great point. Okay, guys, we got about uh, seven more minutes until Around the Rim is officially over. So I just want to go Around the Rim and let you guys have <laughs> – some final thoughts as we head into the selection show, which will be shown at 7 p.m. on ESPN. What are you guys anticipating from the seedings tonight? Well, I think that I, what I'm looking forward to, and, and I've just I've, I've, I've gotten a little more love at this point in the season for the mid-majors, Fran. Um, I've been able to, to call them a little more this year, and I've really enjoyed calling them 
and seeing the talent, the level of talent in the mid-majors. It's, I think it's growing. I think it is a real destination um, for players coming out of high school now. They don't necessarily have to go to all the BCS schools. And it's really nice to see that talent getting spread out. So I'm going to be really interested to see how many mid-majors, how many at-large mid-majors are going to get into the tournament and, um, and see where they're going. So that's something that I'm going to be watching tonight. Who do you think is on the bubble, Nell? I think that on the bubble, I'm really interested to see what Central Michigan, what the committee decides on them. They do have a, a, an injury to their best player, Crystal Bradford, phenomenal junior at Central Michigan for Sue Guevara. But she has an injury, so, and they, they had an early, early exit out of the MAC tournament. So I'm interested to see if they're still going to get, put them in the tournament because they're an excellent team. Also, will Bowling Green be put into the team? They had an early exit in the MAC tournament in the semifinals. Excellent team. Will they get put in? So Akron is the automatic uh, bid out of that conference, and we'll see. Also, the A-10, an excellent mid-major conference. You have Dayton. You have Fordham, who won the A-10. You have St. Joe's, who's had an excellent year. Um, St. Bonaventure. So they could possibly get three, maybe four. Who knows? But um, I think those are two conferences, mid-major conferences, that are that are pretty pretty strong conferences. Carolyn? Well, I, you know, I agree with Nell. And when you're talking about the A-10 right now, Charlie Cream has three teams in and one that is on the bubble. But the thing that I'm looking forward to is going into the season, everybody talked about Connecticut. And just like the previous year, everybody thought that Baylor was the unbeatable. I look for upsets this year, and I think it's going to be an exciting tournament because of the parity that's in women's basketball right now. And, you know, so much the conversation with women's basketball always starts with Connecticut. Connecticut yeah. And Connecticut has, has gone through their ups and downs as far as injuries, but they've been able to still maintain and be undefeated. But they also were playing in the American Conference. So now when you've got to play, in order to win a national championship, six games, uh, and really five, I, won't, I mean, no disrespect to the 16-team seed that they have to play, but from that point out, it's going to be a dogfight. And, you know, will a, a team find a way to possibly get Connecticut in trouble? I don't know if anybody can really guard Brianna Stewart, but, you know, can you get take Stephanie Dolson out of the game? Will Kalina Mosqueda-Lewis ever have an off-shooting night? Will that ever happen? We never thought that would happen with Brittany Griner, and look what Louisville did. So I think that the potential for upsets are why a, a game I'm not calling, I'm going to be watching because <laughs> I think that it'll be a lot of fun. And you asked Nell about uh, bubble teams bubble or teams team. that are on the outside looking in. Mm -hmm. Hey, look at Minnesota and South Florida. Now, South Florida played without their best player, and I'm not going to even dare to try to pronounce her name. <laughs> Don't even try it. I'm not going to, but she's back now. <laughs> and you know, with a o. <laughs> and she does start with a O, but she can shoot the basketball. Yeah, and when you look at US, U, USF, they got a 56 RPI, but their strength of schedule is a 30. And you look at Oklahoma, and they're in, and theirs is a 60. You know, so it's like. Yeah, and, and Minnesota is a 45 RPI with a 24 strength of schedule. And they finished the season 7-3, and three, South Florida 8-2. and two. Will they be left out if they, if they are? That's a real travesty. Yeah. Those are good right. points, Carolyn. All right, Sue, you got any final thoughts? Yeah, um, this is, yes, like Carolyn was saying, there's been a heck of a lot of parity this season. It's been so much fun, and it'll be, first of all, interesting to see how that affects the seedings. Um, there's been a lot of teams changing ranks throughout the season, so first of all, how that's going to affect the seedings. And then um, I do. I also believe that this momentum is going to carry into the NCAA tournament. I think probably there'll be a lot of uh, things happen that we don't think that will, and um, it'll be. I just look forward to it. I can't wait. I called the game yesterday. I called the Southland Conference championship game between Northwestern State, uh, who's coached by Brooke Store, who used to play at Louisiana Tech. Some of you guys may remember her, and they played Stephen F. Austin. And I know the general feeling is that only one of those teams gets to go to the NCAA tournament, and that's the winner. But I got to tell you, even though Stephen F. Austin didn't play very well in that championship game, they deserve to be in this tournament. 
So I'm thinking they're a bubble team. They're a team that may or may not get in. I, I think the general feeling with them is that we're done. We didn't win the Southland Conference, so we're not getting in. But that player, you know, we, we looked at the Janelle Perez, who was their point guard. She was kind of like a mixture of Magic Johnson and Pete Maravich. I mean, she was unbelievable. She was just picking apart their defenses. But we may not, we may not get to see them in the tournament because they did not win the tournament, but I, I, the Southland Conference tournament. But I, I liked them. I thought Stephen F. Austin was a definitely a team that we would enjoy watching heading into the 64 team. Seating. So, guys, I just want to thank you. Say one last thank you for those of those folks who logged on and watched us on NellOnWheels.com. This is is probably the beginning of uh, some fun stuff that we're going to do periodically, not only throughout the the college season, but also the WNBA season, and uh, and just continue this fun this this funness, if you will, going for a really long time. I make up words. Don't don't try to look that up. <laughs> You will not see funness in the dictionary. Uh, but I just want to say, Carolyn Peck, it's good to see you again. Thank you for hopping on. You added so much to the to the show today. Appreciate you jumping on. Sue, favor, what's, Sue, what's your blog? Sue, turn your phone off. Sue, what's your blog? What's your blog Sorry about that. I'm in an office. It's, uh, it's hoopism.blogspot.com. Hoopism. Yes, blogspot.com. Nellonwheels.com is where you can reach my broadcast partner, Nell, Nell Fortner. And of course, tweet us throughout the selection show at Carolyn Peck, at Nell on Wheels, at, Fran, uh, at Sports Talk Fran, and at Hoopisms. And let us know what you guys think about the selection show. Thank you, everybody. And good night and enjoy the show. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.